Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike O'Hanlon with the Strobe Talbot Center on Security Strategy and Technology at the Brookings Institution. And we'd like to welcome you today to an event on technology and the Ukraine war. What we're learning, what we're seeing, what we need to take account of as we think about future warfare and the future of American military power, as well as this conflict and its own trajectory. Amy Nelson will be the moderator. She's a David Rubenstein fellow at Brookings and my esteemed and well-regarded colleague. And I'm delighted that she's put together this amazing event. So in just a minute, I will hand off the baton to her and she will moderate a conversation with Rita Kanaev, Tom Stefanik, Sam Bendit, uh, Jackie Kerr and Gavin Wild from various institutions around Washington and beyond. Uh, their technology expertise ranges from the role of drones on the battlefield, something we've all been watching, to the kinds of sensor technologies that these drones and other platforms carry, to the way in which the data that these sensors uh, manage to obtain is then communicated and shared on the battlefield, uh, as well as dimensions of cyber, artificial intelligence, and disinformation. So that's just a sampling of the kinds of topics you're going to hear about today. Uh, I think this is going to be a really important conversation. I'm going to sign off here in a second and look forward to listening to it along with the rest of you. We'll go until about 10.15. And if you have questions in the course of the conversation, you could email them, please, to events at brookings.edu. One more time, that's events at brookings.edu, where we'll be monitoring and trying to get as many of those questions into the discussion as we can after Amy begins with a moderated conversation among the panelists and herself. So without further ado, Amy, over to you, and thanks very much for the opportunity to listen to this great event today. Wonderful, Mike. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists. This is an all-star panel, um, and it's everybody we would have wanted to hear from on this subject. So, um, so I couldn't be more pleased. Just by way of brief introduction, I'll just say that the title of this event referred to the film Terminator, which premiered 40 years ago and predicted what, for, what war would look like 40 years in the future. Um, of course, it, it, it was for Hollywood, so it took place um, on a battlefield that had been ravaged by nuclear war, but was replete with cyborgs and laser weapons. Um, but futurism and defense planning have always gone hand in hand, and predictions have never been in short supply. So today we'll tackle the subject of how emerging te and evolving technologies have played out on the battlefield in the current ongoing conflict. Um, with us today is Sam Bendet. I'll keep I'll keep intros to to a minimum because you can find lots of information about these incredibly smart folks online. Sam Bendet is a research analyst with the Center for Naval Analyses International Affairs Group, where he's a member of the Russia Studies Program. Today, he'll discuss the use of drones on the battlefield and how their use has met or failed to meet different predictions. Rita Konaya joins us today from CSET and CNAS. She is the Deputy Director of Analysis and a Research Fellow at CSET and a Research or at CNAS and a Research Fellow at George, at CSET, interested in military applications of AI and Russian military innovation. And she'll explore military applications of AI so far in the war, including Ukrainian capabilities. Our own Jack and NDU's Jackie Kerr joins us today. She's a senior fellow for Defense and Technology Futures at the Institute for National and Strategic Studies at, at National Defense University, as well as an affiliated scholar here at Brookings. And she'll focus on the role that misinformation has played in the conflict so far. Gavin Wild is a senior fellow in Technology and International Affairs at Carnegie, where he applies his expertise on Russia and information warfare to examine strategic challenges posed by cyber and influence operations, as well as propaganda and emerging technologies. And today he'll unpack the ways in which cyber operations have influenced the ongoing war and how this compares to previous expectations. And finally, our own Tom Stefanik, who is a visiting fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, will discuss the role of sensor data and autonomous sensing and communications in the conflict with a focus on NATO provided capabilities to Ukraine. And with that, Sam, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to the Brookings Institution for gathering us together to discuss this very important topic. So much of what we're going to talk about is basically going to be taken from the headlines. And in fact, the headlines every morning and every couple of days seem to, um, to seem to add more conversation and uh, more topics to what we're basically discussing. And that is the use of drones, use of unmanned systems in general, 
in this war. And I'm sure by the time we're done, there will be another news item coming out of that war that would probably support or override some of our assumptions or discussions. I think what is going to be helpful um, for you today for me is highlighting some of the main themes and some of the main technologies and some of the main sort of projections um, on the use of unmanned systems in the war in Ukraine. This is the topic that I study very closely. My CNA Russia Studies program, in fact, conducts uh, regular analysis of this topic. We published papers, which are available on the CNA website, that look into the application of unmanned and autonomous systems in the war in Ukraine. So uh, one thing that I want to mention is when we talk about when we talk about robotics, when we talk about unmanned and autonomous systems, today in Ukraine, the absolute majority of military weapons applied, uh, such as UAVs and other systems, are in fact remote controlled. So if we use the uh, military methodology, we're talking about a human in the loop approach. And so, for example, while Russian journalists, Russian media and Russian experts like to use the word robotics, or autonomy is sort of a catch-all phrase. It is, in fact, still very much remote control technologies, which are um, on the battlefield today in employment by both Ukraine and uh, Russia. Going into this war, it is important to know that uh, Russia probably had a, a better chance, at least on paper, um, against the Ukrainian capabilities. Russia fielded something uh, around 2,000 different UAV types. It had very few combat UAVs, but a very extension, excuse me, very um, extensive ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance um, roster of different types of uh, unmanned aerial systems. They certainly practiced with these technologies in Syria at home, and um, uh, they used them in other conflicts and missions. Uh, but obviously, uh, the war did not unfold as Russia intended, or um, or perhaps uh, the war unfolded exactly as Ukraine uh, intended, as far as uh, Ukrainian capabilities, its uh, seizure of initiative, um, and it's really taking the initiative and utilizing some of these technologies in better fashion than the Russians. Both sides today use um, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance drones very extensively. In fact, this is the main mission for unmanned aerial vehicles in the war. Along with that, it's artillery spotting and, and, uh, and targeting for the artillery and multiple launch rocket systems, as well as psychological and informational warfare. Today, uh, no social media feed is uh, basically um, is, is done without any uh, video from a UAV showing either Ukrainian or uh, Russian attacks. What became very clear in this war is that despite all the preparation, despite all the writings and discussions in Russia about the use and utility of combat UAVs and loading munitions, uh, Russia in fact had very little of those technologies available on hand in the opening weeks and the opening months of the war. And its industry, its policy, its government had to act very quickly and fill a very key capability gap. Uh, the same um, cannot actually be said about Ukraine, which fielded uh, Bayraktar TB2 drones, first in combat capacity and then in, in intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capacity. Both sides took some time, but both sides eventually fielded better and more capable air defenses and electronic warfare systems, which push some of the capabilities uh, from, uh, for example, for larger UAVs sort of in the background away from frontline combat duties more to the uh, gathering sort of uh, footage and uh, intelligence about adversarial capabilities and feeding that information to more tactical drones. Uh, Russia, of course, faced a very significant capability gap. And just as before, it turned to an ally. Over a decade ago, Russia, Russia actually turned to Israel uh, and purchased several types of UAVs, which it fields today. Um, when Russia understood that its own loading munitions and combat UAVs are not enough to stop the Ukrainian advance, not enough to put a dent in the Ukrainian capabilities, specifically because Russia's loading munitions have a very short range of about 40 kilometers. Um, Russia acquired loading munitions and kamikaze drones from Iran. And um, this um, acquisition was very much in the news and continues to be in the news uh, today. Uh, Russia fields this technology mostly against stationary targets. The Iranians supplied Shahed 136 and 131, which are fielded under Russian named Gerain 2 and Gerain 1, are actually good at hitting stationary targets, not so much mobile uh, targets that can maneuver quickly away from the original position. Uh, but this is also a very capable terror weapon since uh, Russia can send waves of these Shahed 136 and 131 drones against Ukrainian civilian infrastructure targets, such as electrical power stations and heating power stations, 
<clears throat> and other elements of the infrastructure in order to um, terrorize and force the Ukrainian population and government to come to terms. That is not happening and that is not likely to happen in the near future. But the open question remains, if Russia is capable of acquiring hundreds and perhaps even thousands of more of these drones and assemble them in Russia under its own name, how would this war actually change? This a capability gap that Russia is fielding in loading munitions also perhaps exposed significant issues in Russia's own domestic uh, military industry and specifically defense industrial complex dedicated to manufacturing combat UAVs. It's not like Russia didn't know that it needed these technology. It very much knew that this was going to be an essential part of any warfare going forward, especially after Russia supposedly took some very good notes from the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war where combat drones and loading munitions proved absolutely essential to Azerbaijan's victory. But its defense industry for a very a large number of reasons was unable to actually procure enough technologies that would be able to uh, make a, uh, a capable dent against the Ukrainians, hence the entrance of Iranian Shahed drones. Today, there is news uh, that Russia may have extended this uh, drone contract. It may uh, actually acquire additional drones from Iran. Um, and so the question remains, uh, what are going to be Russian capabilities as a newly mobilized force enabled by these hundreds, perhaps even thousands of loading munitions that can fly for hundreds of kilometers uh, against civilian targets and against some of the stationary military targets. But one of the biggest stars of this war, if we look at this objectively, is the acquisition by both sides of commercial drones. In fact, one of the Russian military generals, uh, generals uh, Baloyevsky, he actually said that a DJI uh, commercial quadrocopter is the real star of this war, and it has elevated artillery to the levels of capability not seen, uh, not seen since World War I. The uh, DJI quadrocopters are absolutely ubiquitous and widespread. They fill, again, a very significant tactical gap in both the Ukrainian and Russian capabilities by providing ISR coverage a few kilometers to a few miles out. So what's interesting about this is that Ukrainians seized the initiative. They were the first who were very um, capable in supplying their military and their uh, volunteers on the front with these commercial drones, mostly DJI, simply because DJI as a company uh, really controls a very significant share of the commercial drone market. And eventually Russia actually caught up with respect to uh, providing this capability and uh, offering this to its military via um, the uh, official channels, but mostly via volunteers. And this flow of commercial quadrocopter technology isn't going to stop. It is likely to accelerate. And what, what's important also is that both sides are professionalizing the use of commercial technologies amongst their forces with Russian volunteers actually launching initiatives in Russia to train military and volunteers in how to handle and how to become familiar with the commercial drone technology. So the real questions now, facing both the Russian and the Ukrainian militaries are better integration of both commercial and military technology into a single mechanism, into a single network that can uh, analyze data, that can actually function um, uh, on behalf of the ground forces, artillery, long range and short range uh, um, uh, forces and, and, the, um, and, uh, and other capabilities. Uh, again, what's important to note uh, if we note uh, the title of our talk is uh, these are all um, remote control technologies. Um, we see some degree of autonomy discussed and mentioned by the Russians. Uh, we see some of those capabilities discussed by other nations and powers building these technologies and providing them to Ukraine. We see Turkey and Iran mentioning uh, autonomy as a capability. But in reality, again, this is going to be very much a human in the loop approach with humans controlling actions and human controlling these technologies, which is why the attack by um, unmanned surface vehicles and, uh, and unmanned aerial vehicles on the Russian Black Sea fleet over this weekend is such an interesting example of how these technologies are evolving with Ukraine once again seizing the initiative and using the technologies long discussed by all major military powers, Russia included, uh, in a combination, in a group, to really uh, strike uh, a, very, a very decisive blow against the Russian forces. This attack has a military as well as psychological significance. It drove home the point that Russian, um, uh, Russian fleet, Russian capabilities aren't really safe even in the home harbor where they are supposed to be very well protected. And questions remain whether these capabilities can be scaled up 
and applied elsewhere. So this brings me to my final point. Both Russians and Ukrainians prior to the war, during this conflict and going forward, consider the application of unmanned systems, possibly with a much greater degree of autonomy, as absolutely essential to future warfare. Both Russians and recently Ukrainians are stating that next war and the war of the near future is going to be the war of the robots and the side that is able to scale up the production of uh, these combat drones, whether they be aerial, ground, or maritime, and really mass manufacture them, is actually going for the win. Uh, Russia and Ukraine are also using a small number of unmanned ground vehicles, but really the UAVs and now unmanned uh, surface vehicles and other maritime capabilities are kind of um, seizing the show going forward. Whether or not both uh, sides would be able to sustain this momentum, whether or not both sides would be able to uh, uh, field a large number of these systems is a good question. It's an open-ended question. Certainly both sides are committed to using these technologies in the war. And so questions again remain, what are the capabilities that these systems can have? How are they going to evolve? And whether each side would be able to uh, really well integrate these technologies into their existing force structure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, that was fantastic. And that question about sustaining the momentum and what it would take to do that has already come up in a number of questions. And I look forward to returning to that during the Q&A. Rita, over to you. Thanks for hosting us this morning. Sam really set us off for an excellent beginning because I think um, he gave a really good reality check about the technologies that we have been looking at for a while and talking about them as the technologies of tomorrow and then essentially kind of understanding the limits of their capabilities in the wars of today. What I wanna do for the few minutes that I have is elaborate a little bit about the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and some other autonomous technologies in this war that we're observing and draw some early lessons with the very serious caveat that this war has unfolded in really unpredictable ways in a way that really undermined and contradicted and nullified a lot of expert assessment and expert analysis, and I include myself very freely in that expert group. So all the lessons that we're drawing are done with the real caveat that we are still very much in the midst of this war. And equally important, we are contained by the information that is available to us. So with that in mind, the information that is available to us is also what we have um, in our hands to assess the use of emerging and new technologies on the battlefield, including artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is one of those fields where there's a lot of hype. Uh, and there's a lot of incentives for all actors involved to kind of sometimes essentially inflate uh, and perhaps even exaggerate a lot of the capabilities, a lot of the uh, autonomy, the freedom of decision and movement and sophistication of some of the tech that's being employed, including for one way or another, some sort of a marketing perspective. So everything that I say should be taken with a grain of salt, given that it's coming from a variety of sources, uh, whether it's official government, media, some of the manufacturers of these technologies uh, that one way or another have an agenda of source, not necessarily nefarious by any means, but nonetheless an existent one. So as Sam uh, started off, we have seen massive use of UAVs, drones, and loitering munitions in this war. And as Sam has correctly pointed out, the absolute majority of these systems are being employed uh, by a human. They are remotely operated. Uh, having said that, it's perhaps interesting to point out that some of the advertised functionalities in these systems are still not fundamentally autonomous in the way that we envision perhaps the killer robot conversation. Even when these systems are advertised as autonomous, we're still talking about functionality such as takeoff, landing, and some navigation, which are essentially more akin to an autopilot as opposed to the type of autonomy we have envisioned uh, towards the end of the targeting chain where a system has the ability uh, to identify, track, select, and even engage a target. 
So this is to say that they're already limited to begin with. Very few of them even have such functionalities. And even when such functionalities, the autonomous functionalities are advertised, they're still quite limited to what they can do. The second set of technologies, which I think is the one that is the real game changer if employed at scale and hint, it's not, but uh, it has one of the biggest potential, I think, and that is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms for the processing of battlefield information. Uh, as we know, modern conflict produces massive amounts of data. And a lot of it is absolutely crucial for making decisions. And we're at a point where humans are effectively unable to process, analyze, and glean useful information, useful uh, information that's useful for decision-making out of that massive sea of data. And that is where essentially, uh, you know, AI and ML algorithms have the most clear potential to help with decision making, to help with creating a unified situational picture of what's happening around us and help, you know, then gain all of the advantages that are promised by AI, whether that's speed, precision, coordination, or, uh, you know, the ability to uh, reach lethality at scale. Uh, essentially, one of perhaps the best, ad, the most advertised uh, examples of uh, using AI for battlefield information processing has been uh, by an American company called Primer. And it's a company that's reported, again, according to news media and some primer representatives, uh, been working with Ukrainian forces. It's unclear which part of the Ukrainian forces in order to um, capture, process, analyze, transcribe, and translate Russian uh, military communications, which, believe it or not, uh, have been unencrypted uh, quite often. So that ability to capture that information on the battlefield to really get in the, within the processes of your enemy, to know what they're saying, to know where they are when they're saying it, and to then so quickly be able to take that from data to information to usable decision making. Um, again, it's hard to assess right now to what extent that capability is being utilized, but the fact that it's already being used on the battleground, at least according to these certain reports, is really significant. And I think out of all the four ones that I'm going to name is perhaps the most groundbreaking. The third set of um, reported uses of AI fall into the facial recognition category. And here you had a few um, examples and instances. You had some reports from Ukrainian ministries uh, claiming that they've been using facial recognition technology or experimenting with it to identify people who are not meant to be in the country. So a combination of, uh, you know, border patrol slash counterintelligence operations, essentially. Again, the extent to which this has been utilized is unclear. The extent such a capability is actually even possible is also debatable, um, especially in, um, in a country that is in crisis and in conflict, and there's massive amounts of displacement. Uh, another example of uh, facial recognition technology is perhaps equally um, cryptic and potentially questionable, um, and that is the use uh, or the you know the stories that are coming out of a company called Clearview AI, which uh, produce that allegedly has been supplying the Ukrainian forces with the ability to uh, recognize Russia uh, captured and deceased Russian troops that the Ukrainians were then were able to match to, let's say those deceased uh, social media accounts. And then we're using this information to contact the parents and the relatives of the Russian soldiers. And as part of a broader, essentially information campaign, to report back to those parents about the activities and the, the demise essentially of their, um, of their sons. That is, again, 
Um, that is an area where I am personally quite skeptical because uh, facial recognition technology, especially coming out of Clearview that has had some issues of its own, um, is not sufficiently advanced or reliable to recognize bodies on the battlefield that have died an unpleasant death and to believe that they were then matched to the social um, media accounts of those individuals at scale is something that I think it is perhaps something that could have been used as an example here and there to demonstrate, but the ability to use that reliably at scale, I think we should be uh, a little bit skeptical of what's happening. And finally, there were also a few examples of AI and machine learning algorithms being employed for information operations behind the um, production of deep fakes and uh, inauthentic and fake uh, social media accounts that Russia has deployed on uh, platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram in its effort to discredit the Ukrainian cause, discredit the Ukrainian leadership, and promulgate its you know, misinformation and disinformation messages. And that's something that we have seen before. Uh, again, this is not unlikely being used at scale, and we're also only able to glean what's happening within this capability based on successful takedowns of those accounts. And so it, on the one hand, we're not necessarily aware how widespread it is, but we know from a broader understanding of AI for disinformation operation is that the future is very scary and potentially extremely difficult and bleak to regulate. But uh, right now it's still uh, kind of na nascent and in its early stages. So with that, I think an assessment of AI on the battlefield is it is absolutely employed. And to perhaps, uh, it is fair to say, at an unprecedented scale. But scale is a relative term. And I would absolutely, I would personally not say or would go as far as saying that AI is used at scale on the Ukrainian battlefields. Simply because something is important and unprecedented doesn't mean that it's everywhere and it's ubiquitous. And nor does it necessarily imply that it's already impactful and is let alone determining the pace, the, you know, the the trajectory and the conduct of the conflict. We're absolutely not at a point where this set of technologies is really making that type of an impact. But again, I think of all of those, the ones that I mentioned, it's the um, AI for battlefield information processing that has the greatest potential and potentially already an impact. With that, I wanna say one key thing that I think is a vital lesson that we're learning. Uh, from this war that hopefully we are able to take into our assessment of the US military, our assessment of the Chinese military, and our assessment of just generally the strategic competition in general. And that is that innovation and the ability to demonstrate and experiment with sophisticated, advanced, groundbreaking systems is fundamentally different from adoption of such systems and the ability to use them in operational conditions to make a real impact on the battlefield. And I think it's critical for us in the think tank space, in the media, and you know, in, the, in government, wherever we're doing these analyses and assessments, to be really, really clear and precise about where the technology is, the one that we're talking about. Is it at a concept level? Is it at a research and development level? Is it just simply being experimented with and demonstrated? Or are these you know, capabilities already being integrated into systems? Are they being shared across the board, across the, you know, within the units that need them and can use them? And are they being deployed once again at scale in operational conditions? And the path from that early nascent concept idea through research and development, all of those points that I've outlined, to use that scale is fraught and full of challenges 
and full of barriers that are not necessarily the worst of them all, are not necessarily technical or technological. If anything, those barriers are the ones that I think require even more attention from analysts like us and those in our community is the understanding of what are those barriers to adoption that are not technical or technological? What are the bureaucratic, the organizational, the cultural barriers that keep um, militaries and other organizations and bureaucracies from moving from these groundbreaking ideas and concepts to at the end, the ability to use such systems and operational conditions. And I, if there's time later on, I'm more than happy to talk about some, you know, innovation versus adoption dynamics that both the Ukrainians and the Russians have demonstrated in this war and what we can glean from that. Uh, but I think the two main takeaways that I want to leave you with is that, yes, AI and machine learning are absolutely on the battlefield in uh, this war between uh, Ukraine and Russia. They're being employed potentially at an unprecedented level and scale and domains. But having said that, their use is still limited. It's still circumspect. And we have to be quite careful that we're not confusing examples and demonstrations with wide scale use, adoption, and impact. Thank you, Amy. Over to you. Thank you so much, Rita. That was wonderfully informative and some really important points. Um, you know, what you just said really mirrors the conversation we have about nuclear weapons a lot. What are, for example, the sociological impediments to actually adopting the technology, the non-technical components? Um, also really helpful to know that um, that this is, is, we're not at scale, right? That this has a long way to go and there's a lot of room for growth or, or fundamentally change. And so what we see now isn't necessarily what we're gonna get. Also really interesting is that tension between, um, you know, well in advance of this war, people talked about how um, the warfighter was gonna experience information overload as a function of, of all the multiple streams of data coming in. And, and separately, a pr the prediction was that the pace of warfare was gonna become lightning fast. And so and the, the role of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and in kind of moderating that trade-off is, is really interesting to see here. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Jacqueline. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be part of this fascinating panel. Fantastic comments by uh, Sam and Rita to start us off. So um, I'll start with a disclaimer that these are my views, not those of NDU or DOD, and um, move on. So I'm talking to you about information in influence operations during the conflict. And um, three main questions I'll focus on. First, what are we seeing and how does it fit with predictions as we're all talking to? Uh, second, uh, to what extent are we um, seeing new things about the relationship between information and influence operations and escalation potential? And third, what lessons or takeaways can we take from that? So uh, with regard to the uh, first, it's become something of a cliche in Washington and elsewhere these days to talk about Russia losing the information war, that it's not performing as expected, that, um, that we expected a 20 foot behemoth. And it, in fact, it hasn't, it seems to be owned to some extent sometimes. Um, and this draws on a long history, of course. Russia, going back to the Soviet Union, long history of uh, significant capabilities in the simultaneous manipulation of information, psychology, influence operations, things like active measures. Um, and with the new forms of technologies in recent years, we've seen a lot of integration of things like hacking and information and influence operations, use of social media, of state media, multiple platforms and dimensions simultaneously uh, for different sorts of uh, mechanisms ranging from uh, micro-targeting to scalable campaigns, sowing division, uh, polarization, confusion, promoting narratives, and different combinations of these tool sets used um, in different instances, ranging from uh, going back to Estonia 2007 forward to uh, COVID-19, everything in between. Um, and Ukraine has stood out as a test bed for all of this, uh, ranging from uh, 
hard, uh, from very technical cyber operations to uh, information and influence operations to hybrid warfare using these psychological information and cyber di dynamics and dimensions. And so it raises questions, what, what's happened uh, given this seeming a uh, violation of the assumption of democratic vulnerabilities, of superior capability that was being studied so much in the West to try to understand this as an asymmetric tool that seemed to play to the advantage of authoritarian states. And we assumed it would on the battlefield as well. Um, and it, it's easy to point to ways in which early on, since even before the war began, the Ukraine and its Western supporters have seemed to have superiority in the information space, ranging from the releases of uh, of, of intelligence leading up to the war to um, the uh, seemingly easy uh, um, debunking of early efforts at fake videos, things like uh, Zelensky videos saying that he is surrendering uh, news stories, saying he's committed suicide or that he's left Ukraine and various things like this. Um, early uh, narratives around fascists and uh, Nazis seemed somewhat ridiculous, to, at least to Western audiences. And stories played out, um, led to more questioning of what Russia was planning, uh, that this seemed to be a false flag operation. Of course, we have to bear in mind that sometimes it's easy to see things as ridiculous from where you sit um, and not pay attention to those slivers of populations where they have more resonance. Tucker Carlson was endorsing and repeating this narrative over and over. There was a leaked memo that seemed to suggest that uh, Russian state media was being directed to play these clips back to their domestic audience of Tucker Carlson, et cetera. And uh, these sorts of feedback relationships with other national fringe media outlets. Um, and of course, we see some repeat of echoes of some of this with the dirty bomb narratives today. But overall, it, a seeming superiority of the Western solidarity around Ukraine, use of um, open source intelligence, fact checking, reporting, the effective use of this David versus Goliath narrative, and even uh, sort of spunky uh, creative uses of uh, things which are symbolic uh, on, and, and so it raises a question as to why Russia failed. And there's been a lot of speculation around this, um, that this was you know, a deliberate attempt to use these, tech, these capabilities, but it didn't succeed. Uh, that this maybe the speculation about superiority was not as correct as we had thought going in, uh, speaks to maybe some of the things that Rita was discussing about the difference between experimentation versus having a unified capability to use something at scale in real time in, the ba in, in battle spaces. Um, but then also questioning of whether Russia chose not to use certain capabilities, uh, concern about escalation or use and lose dynamics of certain uh, capabilities. And of course, there's some integration across the cyber capability and the information capability issue sets here, given the extent to which Russia uses these in an integrated fashion quite often. Um, it, there's also the possibility that these capabilities are not actually the best tool for wartime. And we've thought a lot about them being useful across all um, levels of escalation from peacetime to gray zone to wartime. But of course, in wartime, there's more a laser focus on what's going on. And so these are tools that operate in the shadows that operate best with surprise potentially, and that's less easy, especially if the operations aren't completely, completely covert. Um, but then there's also the possibility that they have been operating in shadows. And again, uh, to something Rita said that we only know what we do know right now. And there are things which um, we don't know because they haven't been debunked and there hasn't been attention to them. And and so there might be further effectiveness than we've seen, possibly not just in the theater of conflict, but outside, but in ways that could affect the theater of conflict. So uh, one thing which I, I would suggest is important to pay attention to is strategic targeting of different audiences. And we see some evidence of Russia working very uh, creatively with different audiences, targeting different audiences strategically in the long term. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of attention to what's going on in Ukraine on the battlefield, what's going on domestically in Russia in terms of targeting domestic audiences, what's going on in terms of uh, things that uh, 
scale to Western audiences to the US, um, but how about um, targeted campaigns against particular NATO allies trying to undermine the coalition? Uh, we know that early on there have been efforts to undermine Polish support or to create fractures uh, through sowing narratives with fake accounts and persona of Ukrainian refugees uh, being involved in crime. Um, we know that there um, is potential for targeting of other NATO allies in similar ways through narratives around the economy, around um, the risks of large refugee influxes around uh, and, and beyond NATO, of course, also other narratives such as food insecurity. Uh, I was in Sweden a, a few weeks ago, and one of the things which was noteworthy there was that the um, uh, the right wing party had gotten more percentage of the vote than it ever has before. There's this historic relationship between that political faction and the Russian nationalist youth movements. Um, and so questions as to what's going on there that we may not be fully aware of yet. Um, and in the global south, of course, there is targeting of narratives around food insecurity, around Western unfairness and unequal care about refugees from different parts of the world and different crises. And there's some beginning evidence that potentially some of, some of these narratives have sticking power. And so while we can't have clear certainty as to what the long-term effects of any of these campaigns will be, right now, they need attention and they can't be written off yet. And so um, thinking about the long-term effects and what lessons can be learned right now, uh, I would suggest two things. First about operational uh, risks of escalation as a result of information ops during the conflict. Well, there's been a lot of speculation prior to this about the potential role of information and influence operations in the current information ecosystem on conflict escalation, crisis instability. I've contributed to some of this uh, discourse and I, I think it's too soon to draw complete lessons. Right now we haven't seen evidence of absolute certainty of this playing a role like fog of war and crisis instability on the battlefield, but we also can't write it off. Um, what do we make of the Kirch Bridge and the um, sort of ready uh, emotional victory of of that on social media and in the media and then the retaliatory response. We don't know what was going on inside decision making for certain and what role that played. And there's a lot more that will yet to be learned about um, the potential feedback loop effects of information and influence uh, campaigns on the battlefield. The complexity of playing to different audiences comes with certain risks of inadvertent escalation. And um, we, what do we make of the, of the dirty bomb signaling right now? Is it an effort at intimidation? It's a very ambiguous signal to different audiences, effort to undermine more support. And what effects will it have to, uh, besides whatever the intentional effects are? Uh, so by way of takeaways, and lessons to, to be learned, I, I'd say that it's extremely important to pay attention to theaters outside of Ukraine and to other audiences that might be being targeted and the long-term uh, strategic implications for support and coalition around uh, Ukraine and support of the war effort. And also second and third order effects of those targeting campaigns on stability in other regions and globally. Also, it's too soon to make firm uh, conclusions about what effects this is having on the battlefield right now. There's so much that still will be unpacked with time. I look forward to the discussion. I'll hand off there. Thank you, Amy. Wonderful, Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, that was incredibly helpful and um, and insightful. Especially, I was I was really taken with the comments, um, your comments about the conditions under which these tools can successfully be deployed and how little we know about that. And of course, the idea that it is still too soon to draw complete lessons. Of course, we're here today to draw some lessons, but um, a certain a certain measure of of patience is going to be required in the analysis of all of this. So uh, and and as well as you know understanding um, the complexity that comes with the deployment of these tools and that there will be second and third order effects you know, with which 
we may not be familiar, we may, may not be able to anticipate them very well, and so very, very much a space to watch. So thank you again, and with that, we'll turn it over to Gavin. Hi there, Amy. Thanks for, for having me. I, I found myself nodding hard at each of the previous speakers' points, and it, it's fitting that I'm following Jackie because I think my broadest point today is that from a cyber perspective, Moscow's longtime focus on the cognitive effects has potentially posed opportunity costs to their technical ones. I'll also caveat my comments uh, similarly to say that there's much unknown and probably unknowable about the cyber dimension of this conflict in particular, but I think it's safe to say that it's certainly prompted a re-examination of the prospects and limits of cyber capabilities in a combined arms campaign and has been less decisive in achieving Moscow's strategic aims than perhaps some predicted. Uh, for the Kremlin, Ukraine should certainly prompt a re-examination of the theoretical and doctrinal expectations that it has placed on information warfare, particularly since Ukraine has borne the brunt of Russian information warfare over the last eight to 10 years, arguably with very little strategic return on that investment for Moscow. Uh, indeed, Ukraine's geopolitical tilt away from them now appears a generational certainty. Uh, contrary to the myth-making of the last several years, Russian cyber capabilities appear to be, at best, adjuncts to kinetic warfare, and at worst, simply unfit for purpose in a combined arms campaign. Their operations simply haven't lent themselves very well to the conventional wartime demands of timing, efficacy, and control, the same kind of dynamics that Rita outlined, and the known operations Moscow's deployed since late February appear to have fallen short in at least one or more of those areas. Uh, this is important not only for tailoring our own expectations, many of which were somewhat outsized, uh, but in the context of Moscow's own theory of victory in the information space, which equally emphasizes technical and psychological effects. Um, Moscow has assigned doctrinally a massive burden to information warfare that now falls under question. Uh, Timothy Thomas of the U.S. Foreign Military Studies Office once called information weapons Russia's quote-unquote non-nuclear strategic weapon of choice. And he concluded, as do I today, that that notion is probably, was probably always due to collide with reality and friction. Uh, for example, a 2011 document released by the Russian Defense Ministry set very lofty goals for information war, including to fully degrade transmission networks and critical infrastructure, uh, to undermine political and economic and social cohesion, to undertake mass psychological campaigns, all with this goal of eroding confidence in the target state's government and inducing mistakes by their leadership. However, the onslaught of disruptive cyber attacks, propaganda, and disinformation notwithstanding, Ukrainian sociopolitical cohesion has arguably not only been solidified, but garnered unprecedented external support and has been galvanized against Russia at a historically high rate. So in short, Moscow essentially bet on information warfare proving decisive in interstate conflict, but has largely had to settle for it proving merely disruptive. Uh, meanwhile, the portion of Russia's aggregate cyber power that gets dedicated to psychological operations, like the ones Jackie outlines, is significantly higher than that of the U.S. and Western, other Western countries. This emphasis on the cognitive aspect is reflected organizationally, uh, suggesting that Russia has perhaps over-indexed on impacting hearts and minds about Ukraine at the expense of impacting networks and infrastructure in Ukraine. Uh, we need only look as far as uh, GRU Unit 54777 or SVR Director at MS or FSB Center 18, the so-called Internet Research Agency, to get a sense of the amount of cyber resourcing and capacity that Moscow puts on the assumption that societies are um, largely manipulable by a cyber means. While the disruptive potential of these types of operations is certainly unquestioned, their utility in achieving strategic goals, particularly uh, amidst a conventional conflict, is far from clear. Uh, if anything, as I said, Ukrainian society and the transatlantic community writ large has done a very good job at pre-bunking or debunking, or exposing and deplatforming these efforts. So the question now becomes whether Russia's best days in the online manipulation game may now be well behind them uh, with regard to Ukraine. 
uh, similar to the dynamics that Rita Sam and others have highlighted regarding conventional armed forces, all of the sophisticated capacity in the world can't compensate for a lack of organizational coherence, doctrinal adherence, and logistical efficiency. Uh, that applies on the cyber front as well. It's all too easy to conclude that Russia's vast disruptive cyber capacity can somehow be harnessed and channeled towards a unified goal. However, bureaucratic rivalries uh, between the intelligence and security services like the FSB and the GRU and Russian military commands over cyber and information portfolios run very deep and very long. And the only entity likely capable of arbitrating such disputes is, is probably the Russian Security Council. And this would potentially make coordinated, broader offensive cyber campaigns as much a political matter as a military one. Now, you'll note that these disputes are not unique to Russia. We've seen similar bureaucratic wrangling in the US with regard to purview over offensive cyber operations. And those dynamics are certainly in play uh, in force, if not vastly more so in Moscow. Uh, meanwhile, Moscow's attempt at establishing a military cyber command, kind of an analog to, to Cybercom, the so-called information operations troops, remains in its infancy. It was only formally stood up sometime in 2014 or 2015 with an apparent initial emphasis on information assurance, counter-propaganda, and psychological operations, uh, much less on technical effects that I've been able to find. Uh, unverified leaks since then, however, do call into question the degree to which there's any real meaningful distinction between the information operations troops and those units of the GRU that engage in technical and psychological operations. Uh, for instance, uh, according to some of these leaks, the leadership of the troops reportedly hails from GRU Unit 26165, also known as Fancy Bear, and his deputy from Unit 54777 which was sanctioned by the US for running InfoRoss and other disinformation outlets, and which reportedly oversees PSYOPs planning for the entire military. In other words, it remains to be seen how much Russia's military cyber capabilities are merely subordinated or repackaged GRU capabilities. Um, cyber scholar Max Smeets recently wrote a book, which I'd highly recommend on the difficulties that states uh, encounter in establishing military cyber commands one of those being the familiarity of adversary networks that is the daily purview of intelligence agencies like the GRU or the FSB that are simply not very easily transferable to other entities like a military unit for actioning. Uh, Russia's cyber forces are appear to have been largely designed for perpetual confrontation and subversion and probably lack the kind of surge capacity that's necessary during conventional wartime. And it's precisely that deficiency that I think underpins U.S. notions of the need for, quote unquote, persistent engagement by its uh, uh, military command cyber forces. Now, the landscape should could uh, radically shift tomorrow. Um, obviously, the prospects for escalation, I think, are certainly likely more acute in the kinetic realm, but still remain in the cyber domain. Uh, the types of uh, destructive malware like Triton and Indestroyer and Pipe Dream which target industrial control and infrastructure critical systems may still be at Moscow's disposal. But the good news is that the allied and commercial capacity that's thus far been brought to bear to kind of preempt and mitigate those types of attacks have made both Ukraine and the rest of us much more resilient. And it's worth considering at least whether some of the most lethal arrows in Russia's cyber quiver have already been fired or neutralized. And in light of the exodus of both foreign technology and domestic brain power out of the Russian market, whether uh, the Russian forces will ever be able to make up for that lost capacity. Um, as for what that all means for US capabilities, I think I would echo National Cyber Director Chris Inglis that it does appear that the defense is ascendant. Um, the coalition of states and private sector and civil society actors that have swarmed to aid in Ukraine's already Herculean resilience uh, project has set a high watermark uh, for both uh, resilience and reconstitution against some of these attacks. And it's certainly validated the, the defend forward concept uh, that Cyber Command has practiced and underscored how coalitions and partnerships can gain the upper hand against uh, even the most sophisticated of attackers. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Amy.
Fantastic, Gavin, that was really great. Um, I'm, I'm particularly struck by your comments about um, how effective we've become at pre-bunking disinformation efforts. We already have some questions um, coming in from the audience about uh, to what extent Russia's failure at large scale information operations is an indication that they're less capable than, capable than we thought as opposed to just the fact that wide scale information operations in this environment are harder than we thought and perhaps less useful. So hopefully we can come back to that in the Q&A. Um, also really striking is are your comments about how Moscow has overplayed its hand on cyber operations. And I really liked your phrasing about how Moscow has overemphasized hearts and minds relative to networks and infrastructure. And of course, now we're seeing kinetic attacks on, on infrastructure, um, perhaps suggesting that you know cyber attacks were not effective. Um, don't want to take up too much time with that. We'll move on to last but not not even remotely least, Tom Stefanik. Tom, over to you. Well, thank you, Amy. And um, you know, this has been really a terrific discussion, and I, I don't really have uh, anything that I, I can add to this on the specifics. I, I would like to turn a, a bit to the future very briefly. And uh, uh, bring the focus, I think, in um, to much more of the sort of battlefield use of information um, and artificial intelligence, which is sort of the subject of our, our discussion today, or so called artificial intelligence. Um, and by battlefield, I mean sort of what's on the ground. Now, the, the war in Ukraine has, has shifted in, in some significant ways um, from the initial uh, attacks and, and warfare in the northern part of the country in a much more urban, wooded area. And now it's settled in, we see, to a, a, much, a more static, not completely, but it's an infantry-focused war. Um, and while technology is still uh, very important there, that's sort of tragically turned into uh, this infantry versus infantry conflict. Uh, that is it just a reminder that ground warfare has these sort of enduring principles. It requires human beings to hold, take and hold territory. Um, now that is to contrast very much with um, a, a potential conflict with uh, China or, or a crisis with China, which is largely a maritime, you know, there's, there's islands of importance, we don't need to go, I'm not going to go into that, but it's largely a maritime region in which the use of battlefield information is very different. But let me just talk about the information dynamics. The detail, there are so many systems and uh, that it, I just want to kind of lay, raise the level of abstraction a bit to think through the future. And we're seeing a little bit of it now. But I think we're seeing just the very beginnings of the dynamics of informa battlefield information technology. And it's been mentioned, um, it's, everyone has mentioned, and Sam and, and uh, Margarita have mentioned this um, quite extensively. Um, but battlefield information really is, is, in a simple sense, it's, it's knowing where things are, how they've been moving their tracks, and what they are. And that information is the key information for fighting a war. So if you imagine, if you kind of take away all the, the various weapons that have been in the newspapers and what weapons we've been sending, um, it will come down to reducing uncertainty in the battlefield, which is a, a, a constant information, is the reduction of uncertainty and the, conf the dynamics of, of dealing with um, and struggling for dominance of battlefield information, I think is the sort of the uh, future dimension that actually does translate to future conflicts, especially great power, con God forbid, a, a crisis or great power conflict uh, with China in a maritime scenario. And by information, it's to again simplify it. It's sensing uh, what create getting data from the physical environment into a digital environment, moving that data, communications, 
interpreting that and then making decisions. And that's the role of command and control. Um, there are lots of acronyms for command and control. I'm, I'm not going to use them. There's, um, you know them, there's C4ISR, there's uh, in America's JADC2, the, the Chinese have their own version of this. But it's really just those things. It's, it's data from the physical environment and moving. All of these things move information back and forth, largely through the electromagnetic. You know, I'm going to use the electromagnetic environment, which is uh, simply that part of the environment that we all live in and use, Wi-Fi, uh, cameras, satellite, uh, radios, everything. Um, and that's the environment, which is the primary, uh, one of the areas of the primary struggle. So if one can sort of simplify the conflict over information, it's uh, injecting uh, noise or disruptive data or false data into sensors um, so that simply there may be lots and lots of data, which uh, uh, you know, we've heard that there is, there is lots and lots of battlefield data, but that data may not contain useful information about what's there, what it is, and where it's going and where it's come from. And that's really the difficulty in battlefield information. And there's lots of ways to disrupt that. And that's where technology is very useful. Now, what kind of sensors are too many to describe, but of course, radar is one of the most fundamental. It has been since uh, World War II and the Battle of Britain, it was, it was essential. Um, and uh, uh, radar, one of the most, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, consequential weapons that have been engaged in Nagorno-Karabakh and, and up, up through the present war in, in Ukraine is these weapons that try to attack radars. And now those weapons, I would actually classify as fully autonomous. Uh, Israel uh, produces, a company in Israel produces a weapon, and on their website, they specifically say, this is an autonomous weapon. And I'll take that at face value in the sense that, um, according to the International Commission on the Red Cross and the US doctrine, uh, fully, fully full autonomy means the ability to uh, 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 fly to a place, look for a target, collect data, uh, interpret the data, and then make a logical decision whether that data suggests there's a physical thing to attack. So that's called selection. That's the, the, Red, the International Mission of the Red Cross uses that uh, as well as US doctrine. And that selection process is actually a logical um, process. It's kind of predetermined. Um, and that creates, a, just follow that thread a little bit or that dynamic a little bit. The um, radar is essential to, as Sam mentioned, uh, air defense radars, mentioned uh, the importance of air defense radars. Well, these anti-radiation weapons are designed to uh, destroy the radars that are essential to the long range detection and then tracking functions of air defense. Um, now, there are counters to air, uh, those. The, it, the dynamics uh, you can ha you're going to have to imagine because I can't spin out all the possible dynamics, but that's purely in the information and data realm. Um, in addition, there's jamming communications uh, to the commanders and from the commanders. So that I think is the future. Now I, I will finish with, I think the future of a, autonomy um, is going to be driven largely be, by the fact that the, um, the ability to jam and disrupt uh, data and communications is gonna force uh, uh, nations to rely more on fully autonomous. That is not the remote control, which Sam explained very well, it's, it's the dominant mode of using uh, and collecting data. Uh, it's going to drive uh, 
countries to use uh, autonomy because they simply won't have the remote control. And that concludes my comments. Fantastic, Tom, thank you. That was really great. Um, really appreciated, first of all, exceedingly modest that you had nothing to add, um, overly modest. That was really informative. Um, I appreciated your comments about reducing uncertainty on the battlefield um, and the role that these that these technologies play relative to um, to infantry. Your comments on ground warfare to take and hold territory, which will bring us to our first audience question. So, Tom, I'll, I'll give this one to you. To win a war, one must take and hold ground. Though the technology of unmanned systems is tactically a game changer, strategically ground must be taken and held. Do you see examples of where automation is enabling the holding of ground taken by boots on the ground? Um, I I actually think it's uh, I I actually don't. Um, and the evidence of that is the relatively static nature. Uh, and let's let's talk about and, and uh, I'm sure the other people on this talk and, uh, are more expert in ground warfare than I am. But, uh, you know, there's a discussion that now there's this pause, you know, because of the, the, the weather and the mud and we're waiting for freezing. And, you know, these are things that we would be talking about from the Civil War era or from the, the 18th century era that would affect. Um, now, at the same time, weather, weather of course, does affect uh, autonomous systems and sensing and all of those things, but um, not, not nearly in the way that it affects ground warfare. So if you just take that one shred of evidence, I, I would say that the, 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 the change in territorial control in, in, the, uh, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, where that is, is still very much dominated by, by maneuvering troops, maneuvering heavy equipment. And, and not not driven primarily by by new information technology. Great, thanks, Tom. A question that came in prior to the to our webinar today: um, How have counter unmanned aerial systems been impacted by the Russia-Ukrainian war? Are we seeing more jammers and electronic solutions for air defense, or is the more or is it the more traditional kinetic solutions? Would anybody in particular like that? Sam, I want to turn to you otherwise. That's a great question. Um, and I do have to actually log off for um, actually in just a few minutes. But um, actually, both sides are increasingly using different types of uh, counter UAS systems and uh, electronic warfare systems. Um, after the initial period of several months, Russia especially got its act together with respect to air defense and EW. Uh, and has been able to impact to a significant extent some of the Ukrainian drone operations, especially smaller commercial drones, which are more susceptible to the EW. Of course, the Ukrainian front is very large and the complete aerial, aerial defense and EW coverage is not possible. And so the Ukrainians have been very successful in exploiting the gaps in such defenses amongst the Russian forces, but Russians are also using EW to a significant extent against Ukrainian capabilities. And this also concerns some of the more tactical handheld counter UAS rifles that both sides are building and fielding in much greater numbers. So as this war is, continue, is continuing into the winter, expect to see more electronic warfare and more jamming systems, more counter UAS systems fielded by both sides. Great, Sam, thank you. A question here for Rita. Um, uh, so a participant really appreciated what you had to say about using AI at scale. Uh, one of the things they've worried about is getting the end users to trust AI battlefield conclusions, um, noting that experimenting on the battlefield might be the best way to get them to trust AI process data and conclusions. Uh, how, what is your take on this? How would you suggest getting end users to trust AI in in um, other than on battle from battlefield environment informa derived information. Machine teams, human AI teams, I think is one of the most important and most interesting questions in this whole space. And there's no, I, I don't wanna say there's no doubt, but it's certainly important that operational experimentation uh, is 
absolutely significant in building that trust and not only building it, but calibrating, determining what is uh, perhaps too much trust in systems that don't merit it or the conditions that don't necessarily allow for it and what is uh, you know, perhaps uh, not enough trust in functional and viable systems. There are other solutions. And in fact, the majority of uh, countries that are developing military AI are not experimenting in operational conditions because they are not involved in operational settings because they're not at war. Um, there is an emphasis on training. There's an emphasis on simulations uh, in particular. Uh, in the end of the day, there's limits to how much even simulations and the most realistic ones and the most repeated ones can um, supplement or it, replace operational testing. So I think it's inherently inevitable. So the more you can get data experimentation to approximate operational settings, especially given what we know about the vulnerabilities and weaknesses of artificial intelligence and how susceptible it is to changes in circumstances and introduction into unfamiliar environments. So the closest you can get to simulating operational conditions uh, both digitally and physically, I think that's the most important. And I, I'll, th the other point here that I think is quite fundamental is that we spend a lot of time trying to understand what it takes to do to build reliable systems and trustworthy systems and how to make the system, the AI, the recommendations or whatever itself, themselves uh, worth the person's trust but we pay a lot less attention to human approaches to technology and human inclinations and human factors. And I think it's quite vital to understand how those human factors and those human dimensions and everything that surrounds us as people are the organizations we're in, the culture we're from, um, how all of that shapes our approaches to technology, not just the parameters of the technology itself. Thank Terrific. you. Thanks, Rita. Um, a question for Gavin, and Gavin, I want to come come back to what I had foreshadowed, your comments on um, the limits of cyber capabilities in a combined operation. And the question from the audience member is, to what extent is Russia's failure at large-scale information operations an indication that they are less capable than we thought, as opposed to wide-scale information operations just being harder than we thought? For example, convincing people that Zelensky is dead or a fascist may prove quite difficult while he's appearing on the news, even for a sophisticated information apparatus. Are we seeing Russian incompetence or a competent Russian information effort failing at an extremely difficult problem? And Gavin, I wanna get your take on this and then Jackie, yours as well, please. Yeah, boy, that's a that's a tough question. I don't know that any of those are mutually exclusive. I think uh, both are probably true. I think on one hand, um, a lot of the discussion around Russian on the cognitive end, let's start there. I think a lot of the discussion and, and focus on those over the past uh, few years, certainly since 2016 in the United States, has uh, perhaps risked inadvertently kind of backing us into the corner of accepting as a as truth the idea that certainly the Kremlin has adopted that given enough technological prowess and uh, resources thrown at it, that societies and human beings are simply wieldable and moldable. That's a very kind of, uh, that idea is rooted in Leninist thought, certainly, but it's a very materialistic view of information that all information is just simply waiting to be wielded and is is eminently instrumentalizable to, to achieve a certain end. I think as uh, certainly has been said here, humans are just a little bit more complex than that. And so uh, certainly some of the identity politics and a lot of the cultural uh, issues um, that Russia faces in Ukraine, I just don't think they factored for and have certainly backfired on them. On the technical side, again, I, I, don't, I don't mean to downplay their capacity. Like Russia is certainly one of the most formidable and dangerous cyber adversaries that the United States and, and the West face. I think where sometimes we overestimate the ability to just simply turn that fire at will. Um, complex cyber operations are very difficult. They demand a lot of time, a lot of expertise, and a lot of luck. And that that's doable in a 
uh, you know, over the long term, as you kind of try to degrade, uh, as the Kremlin has, uh, you know, degrade uh, a society's ability to function or a government's ability to uh, to do its job. But it's tough to do that in a sustained fashion, and it's certainly very difficult to compress down into the timelines that a, a combined arms campaign demands. And so, um, I think a lot of it has to do with the conditions under which Russia is trying to um uh, to execute these campaigns they're just running into a lot more friction and i think both we and them need to do a lot more thinking about as rita says the frictions and the complexity inherent in those types of operations but jackie is certainly uh probably far better suited than i to speak on on a number of those so terrific gavin thank you jackie will you close this out here please Sure. Well, I agree with everything Gavin just said, um, and I'll add to it. Um, with the um, approach to information warfare Russia has taken, there's been a lot of myth making in DC in recent years, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I had worked on Russian domestic use of information manipulation against dissidents and activists, civil society, and uh, got into working on the international cyber and information conflict around the time some of this was starting to become a central topic of conversation in DC. And one of the things that was striking to me was things that I'd seen that were very experimental and had a dynamic of throwing things against the wall and seeing what stuck. And there were failed attempts and successful attempts. In DC, the rhetoric turned very quickly to this is this very laser capable surgic ability they have. And I, I, I always was a tad skeptical of that narrative um, because there's a difference. It goes back to a comment Rita made about the difference between experimentation and innovation versus uh, scalability and being able to do something deployed at scale and joint operations. And I think with the information ops, there's that piece in terms of just the, even on the level of organizational maturity, question mark. But beyond that, um, just the tools themselves. And then there's a question of whether they were ever that effective, even when they seemed to succeed. Um, we know about the successes because they spilled out into the open because we became aware of them, which for some forms of covert ops would be a spelling of disaster, a sign something hasn't succeeded that effectively. And we were always better at demonstrating what they had done than at demonstrating effect and impact. There's been various efforts at research to understand the impact of various Russian information campaigns from election meddling to efforts in Ukraine and, and so on. But it, it's, it's hard, it's a hard problem to actually measure impact. And um, here we see you know, this point about, does this sort of cognitive stuff actually work? Does it work at the level? We've been quick to point out our own difficulties with uh, achieving the kinds of success, even at debunking misinformation when it's important for our own security or health. Um, but we're less quick to point out in these narratives some of the problems with the Russian approach. Um, and another thing that I think is interesting, which speaks to something Gavin said at the end of his uh, comments, uh, is the offense defense balance. So there's been a lot of discussion in cyber and information about the superiority of offense over defense. And in fact, this was used as a justification for strategic shifts in the West because uh, the, 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 the space that can be conquered is so broad, we can't defend it all. Um, we, need to, we need to do something to counteract that. Um, and yet, um, the, the preparation for complex operations, whether it's information ops or cyber ops, particularly cyber ops that require uh, really understanding infrastructure and how and using things like zero day vulnerabilities, this takes a long time and a lot of expertise to prepare. And um, so I think during war, you need really quick operational tempo. And what we've seen with some things like critical infrastructure targeting is just maybe more effective to target things kinetically on the battlefield it's in real time. And it raises questions long-term about how we think about the offense-defense balance going forward with both of these types of operations. Um, I'll end there. 
Fantastic, Jackie. That's a wonderful note to end, end on because it's incredibly thought provoking. I want to thank all of you. Sam, unfortunately, had to had to step out of the room, but I want to thank all of you for your thoughtful comments here today. I certainly learned a great deal. I hope our audience members did too. Thank you, everyone, for spending the last um, hour and a bit with us. Over.